This is the Sailing Podcast with David and Karina Anderson, episode number four. We would love you to come and join us on our journey. Hello everybody and welcome to the fourth episode of the Sailing Podcast. Thank you for joining Karina and I on our journey. The episode today is an interview with George Larfield, who's organised a wonderful aid project to Vanuatu. George has been sailing supplies to the villagers in the Banks Island Group in northern Vanuatu. We really enjoyed listening to George's story, and he's a really nice guy. He's put a lot of effort into this project, and a lot of thought into how best to help the Banks Island people without imposing our values on their idyllic lifestyle. George lives in Gympie. He's got his own boat in Tinkan Bay, just near Fraser Island in Queensland. I think we'll get straight into the uh, interview today and let George explain how he put everything together. He gave me some photos from his trip and I've put them up on the website along with some links to resources about Vanuatu and you'll find these along with the episode 4 show notes at thesailingpodcast.com forward slash Vanuatu Islands. That's all one word, Vanuatu Islands. And you can have a look at some of those lovely photos that George provided there. We pick up the interview just after I asked George if he still has his boat in Tinkan Bay and how he got it ready for sailing. Yes, I do. My boat's called Australis. Yours is Australis. Australis, yeah. and it's actually on a mooring just at Tinkan Bay. Uh huh. Uh-huh. So um, I spent probably two years rebuilding it while I still had my current business in Gympie. Yeah. Um, weekends and whenever I could get down there and throwing money at it for a couple of years until uh-huh. um, it was in really good shape. Um, rebuilt it from one end to the other. Um, what sort of boat is that? It's, is yours? It, it's actually a uh, Ferro. It's built by Samson Marine. Yeah. Um, it's a um, 50 foot design catch with all sails roller furling. Nice. which is quite unique for um, the age of it. It was designed and built in 1975 in Sydney. 75, okay. Yeah. So what, what's, where do you sit on the, the, that argument of people looking like, if people look on trading post and someone puts up a boat that's seven, 1975 ferro cement, a lot of people go, well, don't, don't go there. Have of course, got, of you... course. Um, it's a bit funny sometimes people ask me what your boat's made of and I might say GRP, gravel, rocks and plaster. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because a lot of people don't like ferro boats. Yeah. They've yeah. got a bad name because a lot of people built them in the backyard yeah. and they were inferior. But this was designed by a marine engineer, uh, Pat and June Sampson. They had their own business in Sydney and they were very clever people. Everyone that worked for them um, was a partner in the business, so okay. you know they had all the best interests at heart. So, in 2005, um, <clears throat> I'd finished rebuilding that boat, and um, I'd sold my business. Uh-huh. I just what wanted to business? get out. And I've had a um, mechanical and radiator business for 18 years. Okay. So uh, a lot of my clients said, um, "What do you think you're doing? You can't go and leave us." <laughs> And um, I think my most favourite comment was, um, you don't have to be rich to have a rich life. Yeah. I like that so um, my customers, they said, you know, we don't want you to go and leave us. We need, you know, your skills and we enjoy mm-hmm. bringing our vehicle in and having, you know, my most, the first common comment that people used to make when I wrote the invoice and handed it to them was, is that all it costs and it's done already, you know? Yeah. So it was, um, I took a lot of pride in my work and that was reflected in the finish of my boat. So in 2005 in April I sold the business and uh, I sailed up and down the coast 05, 06 and then... In, up and down the coast where? Um, from basically from Fraser Island to Cooktown. Oh beautiful. So um, you know found many beautiful anchorages along the way and met many cruising people and interested in their different lifestyles and Seems like there's all walks of life out there cruising around. And Who were you sailing with? Like, um, well, I did spend a lot of time on my own, but mm-hmm. you know, my girlfriend came along for two or three months at a time and then she went back to her workplace. So, mm-hmm. um, so you could handle the boat by yourself? You could sail yes, it alone? Yes, oh, it's that's awesome. very easy to handle with all the furling sails. Yeah. So yeah, it was quite good. But 
you know, you're never really alone because whenever you pull up at an anchorage, every boat that's around, you know, mm. seems to come over and say hello or would you like to come for a beer on the beach this afternoon? We're having sundowners. And well, if nothing else, being by <laughs> yourself is probably an advantage like certainly, that. Certainly, You just sort of sit there and everybody's going to go, oh, look, yeah, we're not interrupting him. Sure. We're just going to say hi. And after travelling, you know, a little bit overseas on my own many years, um, it's probably the best way to meet people, mm. I should say. So being alone wasn't no problem, and with the the system on the boat with the sails, um, it was quite easy to manage. So I think quite a lot of the coast guards or VMRs, when you're logged in going up the coast, you'd say uh, one POB, and I'm sure you know they'd be thinking in the background, what the? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, the 2007 uh, trip um, came up. I think I picked it up through a magazine called Cruising Helmsman. Um, there was a Brisbane Vanuatu rally. Oh yeah, I've seen that one. So um, that was organised out of Raby Bay and it left about mid-April, towards mm -hmm. the end of April. And they always organised it around the waxing moon, the full moon. And I think there was about six yachts participated in that particular rally. And it was, um, as usual, a great bunch of people and we had a fantastic trip. And when we got there, some people continued on thinking that they'd see some more of Vanuatu, and particularly the north, more remote regions. And mm -hmm. some of those people took some basic medical supplies and school supplies, etc. Yeah, because isn't one of the guys who organises it at that stage, wasn't it a doctor? Is it still uh, a doctor? Yeah, Dr Alan Profke yeah, yeah. organises that. And um, I've become quite good friends with Alan and Deb over right. the years. So he's um, very much into the aid He's, uh, he has a beautiful home on Ari Island and on one side is a uh, office type clinic so he can treat all the local people on particular oh, Ari Island is in Vanuatu Just, just off Luganville okay. in, in the island of Santo. Yeah. Does he live there permanently mm -hmm. now? Well no, he has um, like a month back, he's a naturopath at Raby Bay so he spent some month back at work and then mm -hmm. a month in Vanuatu. Mm -hmm. So over the period of time of the years, he's taken a lot of medication and supplies over there to help out the locals. Mm -hmm. So they all know that, you know, on say Tuesdays and Thursdays, they can come to his clinic if they have a health mm -hmm. issue and it's free and he hands out um, his medications, which is all natural, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess um, he was the key behind me going initially. And that particular year, a lot of the boats branched off and did their own thing, but um, he and I and maybe another boat ventured up into the remote regions of the north, into the Banks Islands, mm -hmm. where people are still very happy and content, but they don't have, you know, the everyday things like they do more around Luganville or Port Fila. Okay, can I just ask you a question, because my geography is not great, but say from Port Vila, how far north do you sail to get to the Bank Island group? Well... There are a number of islands, as you know, there's probably 83 islands in the Vanuatu group, but yeah. um, Port Vila is on the island of Afate, which is probably the third most southern island. Mm. And then from there north, I guess if you sailed continually, you would just sail overnight, mm -hmm. maybe um, two days and a night to get to Espirita Santo, which is the biggest island in yeah. Vanuatu. And from and that's the other port of Luganville in Santo. Okay. So from there, um, it's usually a jump, a day sail to the top end of Santo, and then another day sail into the Banks Islands group. Okay. Which there's a number of islands, maybe um, six or more, mm -hmm. but um, they're very, um, very much remote in as in that the. Um, copra boats that actually service the islands might only come maybe once a month or once every three months and so they don't are very well supplied if you run out of something it's pretty tough but uh -huh. the people are um, you know very wonderful happy people always happy and smiling and um, the, the kids as they call them the piccaninnies are, are very healthy and fit and sports minded and um, yeah they gather fresh fruit from their, and veggies from their garden every day. So in the morning they go to the garden to gather food for that night's dinner. Mm -hmm. um, I think some people, especially the young, 
probably see the bright lights of like Port Vila and they might leave their home island in the north, go to Port Vila, they have to find a job, they have mm. to find accommodation, then they have to buy food and pay for their electricity. So at the end of the week, they're worse off. Right. So most of them go back to their islands where there is no bills. Mm. They live in their woven huts. Yeah. They sleep on their woven mats on the ground. They're very happy. They don't have any demands or they don't you know, consider materialistic things like we tend to do sometimes mm. here. And yeah. well, you a lot here, don't we? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. was, so When you went up, that was the first year, 2007. 2007. <clears throat> so in venturing around the islands, I see that they needed clothes. They're walking around in rags. Mm. They have very little, like, at that stage... And um, the, the, the rags, like the, the, <clears throat> they're in rags around on, on the outer islands, like on the bank. Yes, yeah. you know, the clothing has just fallen off their backs. It's wow. in tatters, so... Mm. And uh, another issue was that the Vanuatu government didn't sponsor any education, so mm. all the kids, as they call them, pickaninnies, from grade one the parents had to pay to send them to school. Oh. But that's changed in 2010. The Vanuatu government sponsored the children up to year six and now the that's adults good. have to pay for oh. each year to send them after that. So the bottom yeah. line was they didn't have um, much education because the people didn't have money to send them to schools. And does that mean sending them <clears throat> to a different island to yes, get to school? that's true. Right. Yep. So what do they have to pay to send their children to school? Like, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, mm -hmm. but it's probably not a lot in our terms, but, but for them good. to sell a few vegetables and try and make a bit mm -hmm. of money, mm -hmm. it was certainly on mm -hmm. a big scale for them. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they, they were always um, looking when you pull up at an anchorage, your dugout canoes would come out, whether it be adults or beautiful little curly-headed girls with these gorgeous little smiles and mm. and they'd never um, call out or whatever. They might just paddle around the boat and mm -hmm. try and catch your eye or they might just whistle a little and you'd look up and there'd be these big beautiful white smiles and yeah. you'd say hello and <clears throat> um, perhaps um, if you offered them something they might have um, some vegetables in their canoe just to trade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you offer them something, they would always offer something in return. So generally walking around the islands and meeting the people and doing the walks, I see an environmental issue where they had a lot of used batteries that were strewn around the islands. Mm -hmm. They're not very good on taking care of their waste. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, anything that run on batteries um, might be good for a little while, but mm -hmm. then they didn't have a source to replace them or the money. And batteries are really quite toxic. I mean, if, yes. if you're just not disposing of them properly, it's yeah. pretty nasty environmental True. issues. Yes, I agree. So basically, um, you know, I returned from Vanuatu. I spent six, I spent actually six months away, but I spent four months yeah. to the day in Vanuatu because that's the length of time you're allowed to stay. Yeah. So during that time, we did a lot of repairs, whether it was patching you know, a fiberglass tank to repairing dugout canoes with a tube of Sikaflex mm. or repairing some of their wash containers. They wash their knives and forks and plates and stuff in it, have cracks and they mm. want you to fix them. Mm. Um, they're always looking for things like empty paint tins because they have a well and they need to try and get the water out somehow. Okay. So, it was um, it was quite an eye opener in 2007, and being an ex life member of Apex in Gimpy, um, we always had a portfolio that was international relations. And at each meeting, the director would get up and say, "No report." So I was constantly thinking while I was there, "Wow, I'm going home, and have I got a report for you?" Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, Apex is a community minded uh, service club, so. I approached um, the Apex Club on my return and said, you know, this is what I've discovered. Mm -hmm. And we don't, you know, in our ideals, we get up and stand up and say, um, you know, we want to promote international understanding and friendship. How would you describe Apex as a group? It's a, it's a volunteer organisation of business people or is it everybody? Um, I've not actually had it had... It's a voluntary organisation where 
you find you, there is a lot of business people and to start with people really thought that you had to be a business person mm. to join but realistically that wasn't the case you could be um council worker mm. to a mechanic like well that's me a funny thing because i just business. had that in the back of my <coughs> mind and obviously it's a misconception <coughs> certainly what, what does the what do the words or well, what do the letters stand for apex um, that's know. a good question. And being a life member, I should probably be able to answer that. <laughs> it's Young Men's Service Club, 18 to 40. Yeah. So, um, unfortunately, when you get a few years up, they say, here's the door. But it's actually, it's changed a little now. They've changed the age to uh, 45 instead of 40. Apex does have an age limit range. They do. Oh, I never knew mm -hmm. that. Not like Rotary or other service clubs, yeah, okay. because oh. it's always been a young men's service club is right. what oh, they say. Right, every day. <laughs> so I went back to Apex to the meeting and said, look, you know, um, we have this portfolio that no one ever does anything with. Yeah. Here's an opportunity for us, um, Gimpy Apex, that put together the country music muster and mm. most times it's, you know, a pretty lucrative event. Yeah, and we've been donating event. money to the Flying Doctor and yeah. uh, youth suicide and many different things over the time. So my approach to the club, I was very enthusiastic and they know that, you know, I'm serious about mm. what I tackle and um, I told them what I was up to and they said, well, why don't you put in a submission for muster funds okay. and see how it goes and um, I the, did that. I, the Gimpy Muster is the big country music <coughs> festival, yes. isn't it? Yes, it's quite huge, you know, we can have 40,000 people at that event, mm. so, so yeah, um, bottom line is um, I wrote, you know, an application, it was accepted to the value of $10,000. Wow, that's a pretty, <coughs> that's a pretty nice it amount was, of money. It was very good, yeah. and uh, I attended a Kalula, Gimpy Kalula Rotary meeting and told them of my ventures and what I plan to do with the solar systems, etc. that I haven't mentioned yet, but um, they said, you know, how much is it going to cost to put in three solar systems? And I said, um, about sixteen fifty. And they said, who do we write the cheque to? Wow. So the bottom line was that um, I managed to, with the money that Rotary gave me, I used a local electronics place mm -hmm. um, and he gave me all of that I needed, um, basically at cost price. I sourced a lot of things myself, like the LED lights and the 12-volt mm -hmm. batteries out of my own pocket. But the $10,000 that Apex gave me, I really wanted to maximise the value with that. So I decided um, I would try and source dynamo torches, mm -hmm. so no need for batteries, and some wind-up lanterns, so mm -hmm. same deal. Did you find, like, I know I got a cheap dynamo battery for Christmas and they run out as soon as I stop winding. Did you find some sure, good ones we did. that really we build did. up some yep. so, beams? They stay with a light for a bit longer than my five second yes, wind up yes. from, from Crazy Clarks or whatever it is. You're right. There, there is a degree of different qualities. Yeah. And uh, I had China sending me samples at one stage until I found something that I thought was suitable. Mm. I took this sample to a local electronics shop. And uh -huh. he was equally impressed and oh, said, good. wow, we could sell these. Because I guess it's the battery <laughs> that probably is the important factor, is it? Yes. To really yes. hold some charge. Sure. Yeah. So by the actual twist and not a winder that was going to break, yeah. the dynamo torches were a very good quality thing. Mm. Um, they were waterproof to a degree. Hmm. The only problem was we had to buy 3,000 as a minimum. Wow. But that's okay. And we managed to buy just 100 wind-up lanterns. Yeah. Um, so I have a friend with a clothing company in China, so I was able to use his shipping company to transport the equipment Excellent. to Brisbane in a container. Uh -huh. So because we bought direct, we maximised the dollar that Apex mm. gave us. Mm. So you could say three times over, really. No, it's because you're not paying retail. You're no, no, that's right. And free freight into the country because of my friend involved. Oh, wow. Uh, so basically, container into Brisbane and then load all that onto the boat. So mm -hmm. many boats that go over there take a few bits and pieces. But in saying that, we have to be a little bit cautious because, you know, sometimes we're not meant to be taking quite as much as yeah. we do yeah. into these countries. Okay. So um, we, we basically load the boat 
in Brisbane that take the boat from Tinkan Bay to Brisbane. Mm -hmm. And um, to last year in 2010, I'd uh, been skippering this bigger yacht. Um, it's a 63-foot steel catch. It's a borrow design. Mm -hmm. It was built in Fremantle, mm -hmm. um, all steel, and the uh, the owner who had it manufactured in 1984 or five. Uh, took it actually around the world, so it's done a circumnavigation. What's its name? Howard Wright. Uh, no, and the boat's name? The boat's name is Alliance. And what was your boat's name? My boat's called Australis. Okay, so Australis. yes, like, I've got, got the A's. So getting them mixed up. I have okay. to be a little cautious myself there yeah. when I'm on the radio. <laughs> but um, I was offered a job on Alliance as a skipper. Okay. Um, it's owned by a private businessman in Darwin, and he needed a skipper and. Thanks to my friends from the 2007 year in Vanuatu, um, they actually live in Darwin where the owner lives and had recommended me. Great. So I basically ended up being the skipper of this yacht and um, this is my fourth year. So we spent um, five months away in 2010, same again out of... Um, five months? Yeah. Really? Wow. In 2010 well, I went with um, Dr. Allen's rally again. Uh -huh and uh, took as much stuff as we could cram in. We spent days and days loading the boat. Um, what wouldn't fit in in a cardboard box, we took it out and individually placed it so there wasn't too many vacant spaces. And uh, we had um, medical supplies. Um, nice. I have a, a homeopath friend on site who made up jars with very simply printed labels um, with uh, calendula creams for cuts and oh, infections and I uh, had a lot of school supplies. Uh -huh. What sort of school supplies did you have? So we normally take um, pencils and pens and uh, textbooks, uh, writing pads. I took a lot of um, library stuff, kids, stories, books, mm -hmm. um, novels for the adults and um, even um, magazines that had a bit of age on them they've never seen you know mm. take five or woman's mm. day or whatever so and we did all the um all the school supplies had to be um I, I worked out over the time that it's important that this stuff be handed out in the correct way like you don't just go in and give it all to the chief mm. because i find that the chief ends up with a lot of it mm. So what I do now is, I've, I learn something every year of course, and now I go in this particular day when I arrive, I assess how many people, how many families, how many villages, talk to the chiefs and say, look, you know, I have some things on board, I'm prepared to bring in and give away, but I would like everybody present. Mm -hmm. Perhaps tomorrow if we can come ashore with everything, and lay it all out under the shade of the tree and have everybody gather round so everybody in the community can see what we bring. Yeah. So, for instance, the lanterns, I made sure that we had a list of the families and each family would come up and take one lantern, so one lantern for each hut, Good. and everybody would end up with a dynamo torch, but we'd work out a list of mm -hmm. so it wasn't doubled up too much. The clothing is always laid out on the ground, uh, male, female, boys and girls, and no one's to touch anything, and it's all laid out, and then they have a look, and they're allowed to come up and just select an item, yeah. and everybody gets something. Um, fishing lines, I took a lot of fishing line that they call string. Fishing mm. hooks is really important to them. Mm -hmm. um, the, clo the clothing, is that... <clears throat> Brand new clothing, or is it? Well, I did have a lot of um, brand new T-shirts, um, maybe um, a thousand mm. T-shirts in 2010. But this year, we had a lot of issues, um, as you know, early in the year with floods and some mm. problems. And I didn't want to be asking people for any funding, so I gathered a lot of really good second-hand clothing. Mm -hmm. and the feedback there was overwhelming so mm. I ended up with an awful lot of stuff that's very very good quality mm. so the locals were very happy mm. and of course I would take um, guitar strings for the string bands because most times um, their guitars only had three strings and wow that's funny isn't it they're the <clears throat> really basic necessities for islanders yes. aren't they guitar yeah. strings <clears throat> torches yeah. the clothes you, you really 
stood back and had a good look at what's sure. just just hard. I mean, for us, my kids break something, I can just go to the shop and, and grab them something else. Well, what do you do? You, you snap a guitar string. You, it's, yeah, that's a that's tragedy true. out there, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and they play uh, in the string band. They have the old T-chest bass, mm -hmm. and um, most of the uh, mandolins or ukuleles are all handmade. Yeah. But uh, most of the guitars are all bought, but they're very happy to have some strings. Oh, yeah. So, you know, given the time I spent there in 2007, I was mm. soaking up everything that I could mm. to see what was best needed. Yeah, I've got some lovely photos that Missy emailed to me, and hopefully she'll let me put them up on the website I'm as sure. well. I'm but sure. the other thing I saw was I loved the picture you've got the guys with the soccer balls and footballs, because yes. that's, you know, they're outdoor people, aren't they? I mean, to yeah. have a new football. I mean, yeah. my kids love having a new ball, but we can just walk down to the shop and get it. Yes, they're very athletic and yeah. very fit. Um, after you've done the aid work during the day, normally in the afternoons before sunset, you go in with a football and cricket bat. So yeah, all the youngsters it. would come out and yeah. and they were very athletic with their football and the little piccaninnies would really enjoy playing French cricket on the beach. And Great. Yeah, I guess it's really important too that you do um, bring in the right right things to Vanuatu because the, like you said the the boat only comes there once every three months um, so to get stuff off the island if there's rubbish I don't know did they take rubbish off the islands or does it all stay there if, if most of it's um, buried in pits but they, they oh, really yeah. waste nothing so yeah. for us even an empty wine bottle you would never dispose of because they would use that something to do with okay. it wind their fishing line onto it or oh, they'd okay. use it for something right, as a water bottle or mm because they really do have nothing. Um, yeah. You know, it's not like if they get a hole in the bucket, they have to fix it or mm. do something to try and make do. But also another issue was rope. I've taken a lot of rope over the time. They mm. need rope to tie up their cows and pigs and whatever. They mm. can actually move them around to different areas because they don't have fences, so they would just escape. So the local fishermen have an excess of rope down at Tinkin Bay, so the Fishing Association and donate rope every year. Well, they probably, you'd say, they probably have a lot of the rope that they need to replace, but it's probably still perfectly exactly useful rope. Exactly. You know, it's probably like on a sailboat where you've got something, you go, well, I might swap that, and then you've got a 50, 100 sure. feet of rope, and it's actually okay, it's just yeah. that you didn't want it to snap on you at some that's stage right. under big stress. Exactly. Oh, that's great. So, no, realistically, it's... Um, we think we're doing the right thing. Mm. When I say we, um, I guess I've been the origin of it. Yeah. But, you know, like you say, we're not trying to introduce mobile phones or mm. televisions or change their life in any way. Mm -hmm. Just um, trying to make their life a bit more comfortable and the kids can actually maybe do their homework with some light of a night mm. rather than the only light they had before was the flames from a fire. Yeah, and I saw you did some big solar, like the pictures I've got, they've got some big solar installations as yes, well? Yes, on three different islands I put in solar, I either made a structure or added it to the roof and run mm -hmm. the cabling and the battery and some LED lights. Were those installations you did, did they have some sort of communal building that you were <clears throat> putting that in? That's true, it wasn't going in the chief's hut, mm. it was going in an area called a Nakamal, which is... A meeting area for everybody in the villages so whether it be a Sunday school or the ladies meet there mm -hmm. or the men to gather to speak about whatever mm -hmm. so it was quite a big communal area That's so it great. was to be shared by everyone and this year um, I've been back to make sure all of those are functioning mm -hmm. and some of them did have some issues and I was able to fix them and get them up and running mm -hmm. luckily they'd only been out of action a short while two oh, of them so well, I would keep the spares and and I think that's another good point, you know, when I come back and give Apex feedback, I mm. say, look, a lot of people will go and do a one-of thing, but there's never any follow-up, which is important. It's, it's a waste of time if you don't make sure it's all working and can maintain it. That's why I was thinking of how hard to get a warranty <laughs> on a Vanuatu <laughs> island. It'd be pretty hard to you know, bring something like that. I mean, even I just buy an air conditioner and, and six months later I'm calling up because it's, something's failed and that's sure. always going to happen. If you take them a big item, it can be a complete waste if nobody goes sure. back to check on it. Certainly. They're not very technically mm. inclined. But when I do leave, I try and give them some basic... I, I draw 
I have photocopies of the plans of the wiring mm -hmm. that I leave with them and I show them here's the spare fuses and here's how you replace it. Mm. But more than that, they have to rely on incoming yachts mm. with some mm. expertise. So at least by leaving the wiring circuit, even if it's an incoming yacht, they can actually have a look and see how it's wired. And yeah, there's a pretty good chance, isn't yes. there? I mean, I was going to say 9 out of 10, maybe not 9 out of 10, but the majority of yachts are going to have a yeah. solar system themselves and sure. have some idea of what's yeah. up with it. And most people on the cruising yachts have some skills because mm. in Vanuatu, if something goes wrong, you're, out you're on your own. Mm. It's wonderful. What a great, great thing that you're doing for Vanuatu mm. people. Oh, they really appreciate mm. it. Mm. And they are they are a lovely group mm. of people, a so lovely nation. Yeah. They've been voted the happiest people in the world and mm. they're so happy when I mention that that people actually That's know right. that they're happy. Yeah. When we went, we went to Port Vila a couple of times. I've been there three times now, I think, and because uh, that's where we picked up our boat. But we were amazed at the people um, just walking everywhere compared to us. Like you don't see people walking. This yeah. was in Port Vila, which is like yeah. meant to be a big city. Yes. But we just went around the town going. Oh, how lucky are they? Because they've got time to walk somewhere. Yes. Like I feel like it's it's you know we're so time pressured. We're even yes. sitting here today saying what, looking at our clock, you know, because we've got kids to get to and things. But to see their lifestyle yes. really made us jealous because here were these people and they they had time to walk with their family just down the road. It was just to us that was something. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Yes. It was just, it really made us step back and go, oh, we, we don't take enough time to walk somewhere. <laughs> I think my friends give me a hard time when I return here mm. saying, come on, you're not on island time right, now. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, it's a real change. Can I ask you about the sailing around that area? You must have a pretty good good local knowledge well, now. Uh, yes, yes, I Most, do. Just the trip from, you went from Brisbane do you, do you normally sail directly Brisbane to Port Vila to check in there? Uh, this time I did. I went Brisbane to New Mia and then the loyalties and into Port Vila. Okay. But last year I went from Brisbane direct to Luganville and that was across the top end of New Caledonia. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you because I've heard some people... We sailed down... We sailed just back from Port Vila and we went through New Mia. But we, when we left Port Vila there were people who were going to go north of New Caledonia and, sure. and, and down, so... Yes, it's it's interesting, like if you go straight to Luganville across the top of New Cal on the way over, mm -hmm. you're um, heading into the trade winds a lot, working mm -hmm. your way from Santo down to Vila. Mm -hmm. So this time I thought, maybe I'll just do it in reverse, and it worked very well, the sailing was uh, that, much That was better. going through New Cal. Through, from New yeah. Cal across. Across, yeah. Yeah, because we had the trade winds and the currents, so... Yeah, it proved, yeah. uh, it proved a lot better. Oh, that's good. And cruising around the islands, I mean, have you cruised other places? In, to, did you, like, cruise in New Caledonia as well? I mean, yeah. how would you rate Vanuatu if, like, if you were a travel agent and you're saying to people, go sail Vanuatu? It's, I mean, it's not, it's not a huge sort of destination for sailors, but I, I imagine it's probably up there. It must be a beautiful place to cruise around. Certainly Vanuatu has some beautiful places and beautiful anchorage, but it's not quite like the Whitsundays. In between the islands is quite open sea going. Right. And it sometimes can be rather windy and choppy. Mm. But around uh, New Mia, within the outer reef around New Mia and down yeah. towards the Isle of Pines, there's a lot of protected waterways and beautiful mm. islands and beautiful water. Yeah. But um, the it, water temperature is a little cooler. Vanuatu is much warmer. Yeah. Do you, is it really reefy, sort of, you know, going from point to point in Vanuatu? Is there a lot of reef to watch out for? Uh, not really. No, no, it's, no, it's a bit no, more it's, open. Yes, it's a pretty, very much open sea going. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, which was a surprise to me in 2007 after being in the right. Whitsunday so many years. I had just envisaged, you know, 74 islands in the Whitsunday, 83 in Vanuatu will be. It was quite different. Did you have a particular sailing guide that you used? Like, I think in my boat I've got a... I know I've got a New Caledonia book. Is there something that's specific to Vanuatu, a cruising guide? There, there was a basic cruising guide that mm. was um, put together by a previous cruising boat way back maybe mm. in the 80s. 
That's what I'm wondering whether I haven't got some a photocopy of something up with Vanuatu. Yes. Uh, some of the anchorages there, but is there is not really a commercial book out there? No, not that I know. Right. I've, I've, there is a disc available. Maybe that's what I've got. The disc somewhere I've seen. But I've just had a copied book, maybe a bit like what you're speaking about. Yeah. And it's been completely printed properly since I think, and okay. is quite you know yeah. good form now, but. The one I have is kind of like it's got pencil sketches of the beach and here's right. the dinghy path and here's the chief's house and it was very informative and very accurate, like mm. the chief's names and et cetera, et cetera. Well, you must have a pretty good <clears throat> knowledge enough to, to put a book together. Have you ever thought about that? How much um, sailing you've done there? Yeah. How many months total would you say you've been sailing in Vanuatu? Because you, you must be like the Vanuatu specialist now. Well, yeah... Um, it's quite handy that uh, I think the owners of the boat are quite happy to come visit because I know the best places to take yeah, in, etc. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah it's, uh, I do know my way around pretty well. Do you use a particular chart? Uh, like, do you have electronic charts that you're using as well? Yes, we do have this, a few ones? different. We have a few different, um, yeah, different electronic charts plus paper charts, but yeah. It's it's all pretty easy. Vanuatu sometimes has a bit of a problem with electronic navigation. It seems to be about half a mile out to the east, so mm. maybe people have to go in and change the data. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, Numea, the um, it's a bit of a worry being perfect. half and half a mile <clears throat> out. <laughs> Certainly, coming into a place at night, being yeah. half a mile out yeah. to the east, can be a bit tricky. Yeah. So, Must be nice to have a steel yacht, though. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> have many... you have you had any problems? No, I haven't. That's great. But there's been many times that you know people would say, "Okay, it's nearly dark. Um, mm. You can take the destroyer, and we'll follow you." Right. 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 <laughs> someone was listening to this podcast and they wanted to um, become a sponsor for you and donate some money towards the cause, how would they go about contacting you or cont- you know contacting you to so that they could make a donation? Oh, well, certainly um, that would be most welcomed and, you know, whether it be minor or major degree, um, certainly most welcome, but I'm basically contactable just by phone. Uh, or when, we, when we put the podcast up, on the on the internet, we'll we'll create a page, and you're happy for us to put an email your email address there. So if somebody listens to it, they could just look at the page, and uh, maybe send you a note or something if they were looking to see Certainly. what's going on. And if you've got some plans be to, nice get, to get some more stuff over there, Certainly. what's your email address? Say so say it for me. My email address is just my name G Larfield yeah. at ozwide.net.au Mm-hmm. That's good, and and I'll probably I'll I have to, I'll check with Missy. Hopefully, we can get some of the photos up, which are from this year's trip. Is sure, that right? they're all my photos. Yeah, are they your photos? Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't sure who owned them because no. you sort of got that issue that you've got to make sure we're not sort for of some reason putting um, up somebody else's photos. Oh, they're good. So they're your reason, collection. I, I wasn't able to send that bigger okay. file. Oh, would you like me to put some? Can I put some of the pictures up then yeah, as well? Them. We'll do that and then we can put the link to your email address if people want to contact sure. you or yep. if they email us, we'll put them in contact with you and sure. try and maybe even keep some updates if something else is happening. We can sure. always have a link, can't we, yeah. to yeah. say, oh, yeah, here's the next group that are going over and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Excellent. I'm, I'm always interested to talk to other people that are involved with the aid as well. It's uh, always somebody has a different version of what they think is appropriate and yes, how to yeah. improve things and what they might be doing yeah and between us all hopefully we get it right you what you've done you've made a real change in some people's lives but not not in the sense that you've sort of just you know some people might just think oh, i'll send a whole bunch of money somewhere and that probably doesn't get distributed you're really doing like on the ground work right that's at the awesome. cold face yeah at the cold face that's difference. what i'm trying to say yeah yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's great. awesome thanks thank for your time you. yeah, no, thank, thank you, you. Thank it's you. been very enjoyable Well, I'd like to thank George for taking the time to let us know about this project. And as he said in the interview, he'd love to hear from anyone interested in his work or in putting together aid packages for Vanuatu or similar projects. George's email address is glarfield, it's G-L-A-R-F-I-E-L-D, at auswide.net.au, and you spell that O-Z-W-I-D-E dot net dot A-U. 
I'll put that address up on the website along with the pictures that George sent me from his trip. They'll be all with the show notes at www.thesailingpodcast.com forward slash Vanuatu Islands. I also added a link to an article in the Gympie Times, that's a newspaper, which has some coverage of the trip that George did. I uh, would invite you to go there, have a look, leave us a comment and let us know how you enjoyed this episode. Of course, you can always just email me, david at thesailingpodcast.com. Our next interview is with Claude, who sailed his 18-foot yacht that he built himself from Montreal, Canada, through the Panama Canal, across the Pacific and all the way back to Australia in the mid-1980s. He's got quite a few interesting stories to share about his journey. So don't forget, go to iTunes and subscribe to the show. If you get a chance, please leave us a review also in iTunes. I think that by leaving a review, you'll help us to get the word out about the show. Thanks for listening. I hope you have a great day and thank you for joining us on our journey. You've been listening to David and Corinna Anderson of The Sailing Podcast. Ooh, wah, 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 wah. Ooh, wah, wah, wah.